A Lantern, Chapter 17 The snow began in October that year and did not leave until the last of March. Wherever there were fences, the drifts piled high and obliterated them, so that one would not have known any had been built. Nature's little joke, as though she were laughing at the settlers for their pains. The children's attendance at school was broken constantly by severe snowstorms, so that Abby again did much of the teaching herself. She often searched her mind for new ideas, trying to think of what more she could do for the children. Time was slipping away and conditions were not better. Even if she must face the hard fact that she could never do anything more for herself, the children must have some of the best things of life. Will was working day and night, making an old man of himself before his time. She must do more for the children some way. She must not let them grow up without a taste for good things. They ought to know more about music and have more reading material, and because they were not getting them, in some way she must instill in them the desire to have them. They must never be satisfied with things as they were. Even if she and Will were to live in a Saudi all their lives, cut off from those things, the children must want to have them. If the desire were deep enough, they would find a way to seek them out as they grew older. She began getting down the Shakespeare plays for a while each evening and requiring Mac and Margaret to learn a passage or two. Over and over she made them repeat. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. Or perhaps, there's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. Mac protested. Aw, oh, shucks, I don't see any sense to them. It's for your own good, Mac, she would say. Some day when you're older, the meaning will all come to you, and you'll be glad you learned so much of them. But Mac was more interested in his old brass horn. There was a six-piece band over at Cedar Town now, and that spring one often heard the faraway blare of the three brass instruments, the toot of the fife, and the rumble of the two snare drums. The organization was preparing for their first 4th of July celebration in the community, and patriotic airs were as much in evidence as the spring winds. Mac, herding hogs, would sit at, a, at the western border of his father's land and windily blow out the same tune which the band was practicing. As he was usually two notes behind the others, his part in the proceedings sounded like an echo. It began to bother the legitimate performers so that, more from sheer self-defense than enthusiastic desire, they invited him to join them. Mac's round, freckled face beamed at the invitation as one receiving a congressional medal. All the masculine hands donated work that spring toward the building of the small frame GAR Hall. It was completed in time for the 4th of July celebration and dedicated with much oratory and a baked bean supper. Sarah and Martha Lutz and Abby had sewed yards and yards of unbleached muslin together to form the top of a bowery, over which were placed branches cut from the trees at the creek bend and under which all the residenters within a 20 mile radius danced. By 1880, the deal land was all fenced. The fence was a symbol, man's challenge to the raw west. Every fence post was a signpost. More plainly than flaunting boards, they said, we have enclosed a portion of the old prairie. We hold between our wooden bodies the emblem of the progressive pioneer, barbed wire. We are the dividing line. We keep the wild out and the domesticated within. The road, too, which followed the old buffalo trail, had been surveyed and straightened. Man's system had improved upon the sinuously winding vagaries of the old buffalo, and the road, although still grass-grown, ran straight west past the house. The development of the road is the evolution of the various stages of civilization. But though man could fence the prairie and direct the way of the road, he could not control the storm. This far shalt thou go, and no farther, the god of the settlers seemed to say. Snows, droughts, blizzards, dust storms, rains, hot winds, and the little pygmy people. He held them all in the hollow of his hand. 
On the 17th of April, the Deal family drove in the lumber wagon across the prairie to attend the funeral service of a distant neighbor. The day was warm and windy and disagreeable. Little miniature whirlwinds of dust spiraled themselves ahead of the team and the dry particles of dirt flew back in their faces. As they rode, the wind grew in volume and the dust clouds thickened with the rising of the wind. Before the fury of its force, great sheets of topsoil from the newly plowed fields were lifted into the air and thrown with violence over the land. When the family reached the schoolhouse, they found their neighbors sitting there with dirt blackened faces almost unrecognizable. The room was dense with dust clouds, the little building shivering in the onslaught of dirt. At one blast of wind more severe than others, the minister paused in the midst of the funeral eulogy and said, There are times when it is wiser to think of the living than to honor our loved dead. I think it's wiser that we disperse at once and drive to the cemetery. Will and Abby thought they could not get home through the terrific storm. It was like swimming the waves of a dirty sea. Abby held Isabel closely and Mac and Margaret kept John's hands in their own. In fear of colliding with someone, Will did not drive the horses off a walk. Slowly they crawled over the prairie, through the dense dust clouds, with only occasional moments of the lifting of the dirt, in which Will, watching for the road, would guide the blinded team back into the trail. The storm was like a blizzard in its fury, a black blizzard with grit and dust for snow, with the field dirt for drifts through which they drove. Eyes and ears were full of the gritty earth particles, and at times it seemed that they would suffocate. Then Will would stop the team for a rest before plunging again into the black whirlpool of dust. At home, Abby thought she could not endure the sight that met her eyes. Over the burlap floor covering lay a soft inch thick carpet of dirt. Over the curtains and the beds lay the same grimy substance. It floated on the water pail and in the milk in the cupboard. There was nothing in the house in condition to eat and nothing that could be worn without washing. And so, once more, the young pioneer mother bent to the task of fighting the elements to help make a home on the prairie. Surprisingly, that year crops were good. There was an indication of better times to come. Prices went up. Will and Abby began talking and planning about the new house. No, that is not quite true. Abby began talking and planning about the new house. It is the woman's prerogative. Mac was 13 now, Margaret 11, John 8, and Isabel 3. They were getting too old to be packed in like little chickens in a coop, Abby said. Every moment that was free from the ever-present hard work, she sat with pencil and paper and drew plans for a house. Even if it's just a few rooms at first, she would say to Will. They'll be nice, and we can plan it so they'll be added on to as time goes on. Can you think of anything grander, Will, than a sitting room all with clean new white plaster and a kitchen that's built to be handy and two upstairs bedrooms for the older children? I'd like to do it for you, Abby girl. Maybe we can if I do a lot of the work myself. That summer they stopped at the J. Sterling Mortons, as they had often done on their way to Nebraska City, and the visit inspired them to both greater activity and making a better home. The Morton house seemed the last word in grandeur with its bay windows and real shingled roof, its fancy wallpaper and figured carpet, its tidies on the backs of all the chairs and splashers behind the washbowl and pitchers. That fall and early winter, remarkable weather prevailed. It was unusually warm. Migrating songsters stayed on. The robins and the bluebirds, the phoebes and the redbirds, even an occasional meadowlark gave its June call in that wonderful Indian summer. There was in the air that haze which is found nowhere but in the Midwest, and at no time but late fall when winter loiters on its way. That glorious haze which is not air, nor sunshine, nor smoke, but a little of all three. Air from over the wild free prairies, 
smoke from a thousand burning weed bends and brush fires, and sunshine filtered through the sifting, shifting smoke and air. There was bronze on the clumps of the oaks along Stove Creek, red on the maples, yellow on the cottonwoods, green in the late pastures, white clouds dipping low, and over all that haze which is not quite smoke, nor air, nor sunshine, but a little of all three. In the last half of December the spell broke. The winds blew over the prairie, tumbleweeds from far out in the open rushing headlong before their terrific onslaught piled up against the fences and the little buildings. The leaves on the clumps of trees by the creek blew into nowhere. The pickets around the little cemetery caught and held a brown drift of leaves and tumbleweeds. The birds scurried before the wind. The snows came. By Christmas, the snow was 15 inches deep on the level and crusted over. A delicate shimmering steel which held up men and the lighter animals on its surface. Will could not get to town with his team, but would walk over to the store with a sack on his back. Snow drifts were 10 and 15 feet deep. Days were bright, sunshiny, and zero at noontime. Nights were clear, white lighted, and 22 below. All winter the deep snows held. On ranches farther west, thousands of cattle died. The spring found many of the ranchers ruined. The snows melted and the streams ran high. Stove Creek came halfway up the pasture and departing, left behind the slag of the creek bed. When the weather settled, the deal started the new house and Abby Deal thought heaven could not hold more joy than the planning of those five rooms. Will hauled stone from Louisville and pine and cottonwood lumber from Nebraska City. And one day, when there was a sick cow and he could not leave, Abby went alone for the lumber. Old Daisy Drum came with his hammer and his saw and his plug of tobacco, and watching him labor, one would have thought there was some invisible mechanical connection between his jaws and the other tools. So harmoniously did they work. We'll have the sitting room there and the kitchen here, Abby told Daisy. And old Daisy, with a few comments, but much tobacco chewing, placed the sitting room there and the kitchen here. The result was weatherproof and sturdy, but only in the light of later years was it proven artless. Only to other than the eyes of Abby Deal did it ever appear devoid of artistry. To Abby, it was always a thing of architectural beauty, for it was conceived from love and desire in the days of her youth. There were three rooms downstairs, a sitting room, a kitchen, and a bedroom for Will, Abby, and little Isabel. Up the uncarpeted pine stairs was a room for Margaret and one for Mac and John. I've planned it so we can build on a room later, right to the front, Abby would say. Then someday we can cut double doors from the sitting room into a new parlor. The cedar trees which Abby had set out years before had not lived through the droughts. So now they put out a new group, nine on each side of a potential path leading up to the front of the house. Lombardy poplars in a long row were set out at right angles to the main road, following the track to the barn which Will's wagon had worn in the 13 years. It'll make a nice shady lane road, Abby would plan, and some day will have the white picket fence. Yes, the real home was beginning to shape itself. In the middle of the summer, they moved into the half-finished house. They scarcely knew what to do with all the space. They could not quite get used to the fact that the family of six could spread itself out all over five rooms. After the two-room Saudi, the simple plain house seemed a palace. It represented a big move forward. They were about to see daylight. After 13 years, they were actually beginning to witness results. Trees were commencing to give shade. Orchards were beginning to bear. Better crops were being harvested and high prices given. To Abby, it seemed that for the first time, they were really going to live. The Deal family was representative of other families its condition indicative of state conditions. 
the western half of the state began to be settled. The old range cattle ranches were practically finished. The grain farmer was moving in. Wagons again passed the deal home, going west this time. Prairie schooners once more crawled over the old buffalo trail, pushing on now to the grassy valleys which lay between the sand hills or the fertile plains beyond. <laughs>